we're looking at one of the greatest paintings of the High Renaissance, and really one of the paintings that really expresses what the High Renaissance is. Yes. Um, it's Raphael's The School of Athens. Right. And it's in, in one of the greatest, most extraordinarily decorated rooms in the Vatican. In the Papal Palace. Yeah. And the name of the room is the Stanza della Segnatura. It was painted by Raphael between 1509 and 1511. Right. And it's right at the time Michelangelo is painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And they must have gotten to know each other. Oh, I bet they did. Yeah. Um, it is really an ext extraordinary expression of the embrace of the Catholic world during the High Renaissance of the classical world. Yes. Really looking back at the greatest minds of the classical tradition. Yes. I always think about this as a kind of humanist's dream come true. It is. You know, because what we have is under one roof all of the greatest scientists and mathematicians and philosophers and thinkers of ancient Greece of ancient Greece people who lived at all different time periods so it's definitely a f kind of fantasy it's a fabrication and actually a kind of messed up fabrication I have to say because you said under one roof if you look at the roof this is classical Roman architecture yes. not classical Greek no, architecture so that's Raphael true. is actually sort of screwing this up a, a little, little bit. bit yeah yeah and in fact the architecture while we're on it that we see in the School of Athens is probably, um, you know, taken from Bramante, who's uh, there at the same time, okay. redesigning uh, or or doing the designs for the new uh, Basilica of St. Peter's. Ah, uh, right, which and is so, just next door. Right, so, so say you have St. Peter's being rebuilt along the lines of ancient Roman architecture. You have Michelangelo painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, and at the same time... What a moment. Raphael's painting the... the Frescoes in the stanze, the rooms, by the way, stanze means rooms. So the stanza della signatura means the room of the signature. So this is where the Pope would have signed important documents. Exactly. So, so there's a lot of figures in here, this very complex architecture, but the architecture, because of the linear perspective, the orthogonals, really points us to the key figures, the two central figures. Yes, and, and these are the, not just the two central figures in the painting, but in a way the two central figures in Western philosophy, Western ways of thinking the Western, about the world. And science, really. And science, right. Absolutely. So, okay, so we have two figures that are really beautifully framed by the, by the smallest of the arches, and actually all of the arches. You have Plato, and you have his student, Aristotle. That's right, and, and they kind of represent the two sides, in a way, of Western uh, thinking, right? You have Plato, uh -huh. who... He's the figure in the red and the gray. Right, um, and he points upward. Because he's interested in the spiritual. In but in, in a world that transcends ah. the everyday world. So he's pointing up, and actually one could arguments ha and have that the four elements are here, that, that, that Plato is represented by the red of fire um, and by a gray of what the Greeks would have called ether, that is, of the non-tangible mm -hmm. elements. Mm -hmm. And Aristotle, on the other hand? Well, he's wearing... Holding his hand down. That's right, actually, to the, to the tangible, to the actual, to the physical, to the observable. Right, which is what Aristotle focused on in his philosophy. What can we observe? How can we make sense of the world that we can see with our senses? Not the world that we can't see, which is what Plato was interested in. And, of course, he's wearing blue and brown, um, which would be water and earth, those mm. elements that, that respond to gravity, That's that are right. physical. We, we have two, two different ways of thinking about the world, that the world is the way we see it and experience with it with our senses, and this is the way we can approach uh, human understanding and knowledge, and a sense that there is something higher and greater and perfect related to the divine for Plato, which was in large part also thought in term, about in terms of mathematics. Interesting. So... This painting is really a balance between those two aspects, isn't yes. it? Yes. It's really, I mean, it's really quite, quite a glorious kind of harmonious expression then. Yes. And in fact, all of the figures, um, as they're organized, are really sort of divided between those two sort of schools of thought. Right. On the On side with Plato, yeah. we have the uh, mathematicians and... Um, I think the philosophers that are thinking about ideas that are not related to the physical and the actual. Not trying to explain the physical and the actual. That's right, that's right. Whereas on Aristotle's side, you have people who are, in a sense, um, scientists in some sense. So maybe what we should do is actually point out a few of these figures and really speak about them a little bit. We can do that. Before we do that, I, I would like to talk about the architecture sure. as overall, because I think that this is, for, first of all, in two ways. Not, we have this really grand architecture that's really unprecedented. It's a little over the top, isn't it's it? Really, and, and, you know, it's just, 
it's an architecture that's very high, these round arches, these classical sculptures in niches on either side. Which, by the way, represent the same kind of um, dualism that we were talking about. That's right. We have we have Apollo on, on Plato's side. The god of poetry and music. That's right. And we have Athena on on the on Aristotle's side, war, wisdom, um, right. a, a more much more practical. earthly kind right. of figure. And so what I was going to say about the architecture is that it, it elevates and ennobles the figures. It, it creates a context, just in the way that Leonardo did in The Last Supper, where the architecture worked with the figures to help tell the story, to create meaning. I think here, similarly, the architecture just you know i mean if you imagine a very different space the figures become very different that yes. the, it 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 elevates them it, it somehow is an architecture that speaks of the achievements of the mind it, it it is absolutely a celebration as this painting is a celebration of of the potential of human achievement and what could characterize the high renaissance better than this idea of what man is capable of 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 reaching almost a kind of divine status in its creations exactly and I think that the other thing that's important to keep in mind is just how many figures there are in this painting. Just Raphael's achievement. It's so much fun. I mean, there's, you know, there's dozens of figures here. And there's, you know, this complex composition where no figure is repeated, where everything just looks so lifelike and so natural. Like Raphael just, you know, it, it doesn't even look like this took any work on his part. You know, it's it, there's it's a kind of complexity and um, and there's a kind of facility, facility that, that here, Raphael yeah. has. I mean, there is nobody that paints more with more facility than Raphael. No. He, he is, looks like it sort of, he makes it look absolutely natural right. and, and with such ease right. that like there the, could like be the, only one solution. Like the greatest of ballerinas it's who true. doesn't look like they practiced for hours it's and hours true. and hours. I want to go back to a point that you made a moment ago though that was important, which is what does it mean to have all of these figures mm -hmm. together? You know, it's so interesting. The, the Renaissance really came back to this periodically if we look at one of the most important texts to sort of um, that is actually pre-Renaissance but really sets up the Renaissance, you could look at, um, at Dante's Inferno. Mm -hmm. And in the very beginning of Dante's Inferno, when, uh, when we actually visit Limbo, mm -hmm. we actually get to meet some of these great yes. Greek figures. Yes. And it was very revolutionary, this idea of retrieving them from um, the way in which the medieval tradition had looked at the Greeks, yes. which was with incredible disdain. Mm -hmm. And so here they're being celebrated. What a radical reversal. It is. It is. And, and it's a moment that won't last long in the church. No, in fact, it's almost over. It's almost over. over. It's the almost Reformation over. is about to happen. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the primary okay, figures Okay, should we here. start with the lower left? Sure. And actually, let's start sort of actually lower center left. Okay. At the very large, really the most massive figure in the this painting. Seated figure. Yeah. Wearing those heavy workman's boots. Yes. Um, crouched over in a sort of um, leaning and actually writing, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. And kind of twisting his body. The figure that's being represented here is the great um, ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who's probably best known for thinking about time as something that is constantly in flux. Um, you know, is he the one who said you can't step into the same river same twice? Same river twice, that's mm -hmm. right. That he uh, equated life like a flame, that it was never uh, repeated, that everything was a, a sort of infinite variety. Um, but here, of course, Raphael had no idea what Heraclitus actually looked like, so asked um, somebody that he knew to sit in as a model. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was Michelangelo. Yes. and But to me, what he did was he really tried, not only painted Michelangelo's Heraclitus, but took on Michelangelo by making him, you know, sort of painting him in the way that Michelangelo had painted the prophets and the sibyls, these large, uh, monumental, seated figures. So Raphael's sort of taking up Michelangelo's challenge and saying, oh yeah, well, I can do these amazingly beautiful seated figures too. And with the kind of massiveness and majesty that Michelangelo brings to those seated mm -hmm. figures, whereas so many of the other figures in this painting are much more delicate in their rendering, yes. Michelangelo has been rendered as a <laughs> massive, powerful figure. As a Michelangelo-esque figure. It's wonderful, isn't yeah. it? It's almost a parody. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, Raphael reminds us here, because Heraclitus is, Heraclitus is depicted as writing, reminds us that Michelangelo was also a poet. That's true. And so let's talk about uh, my favorite figure, who's the figure on the far left. With the bald head. With the bald and head. And the beard. And the beard. Um, and that's Pythagoras. 
who uh, is um, who we might remember from high school geometry the, a squared plus b squared equals c squared the Pythagorean theorem. But who was really an entire school of thought unto himself. Yes, and and Pythagoras is is doing some diagrams about how harmony relates to music and numbers, and how underlying harmony is the is is a kind of mathematical structure a kind of rational structure yes. that could be understood and in a sense measured really yeah so yeah that's right Pythagoras is known for having written um, the harmony of the spheres which is clearly being referred to mm -hmm. here this critical ancient text which was missing which where he really asked this fundamental question which is what is beauty and right. in a sense what could be a more important question for Raphael himself right what is beauty? How does beauty relate to harmony? And is there a, 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 a sort of underlying, source. right, an underlying source and structure in the universe that somehow? I mean, is beauty then a manifestation or something created of by of, by God, right? Which is such a high Renaissance idea right. that that the contemplation of beauty is is in a way a, a contemplation of the divine and of course we would see this on plato's side that because makes these sense. are absolutely neoplatonic ideas very much so okay um should we move over to the to the right side sure to euclid well here we see really the scientists the people who tried to understand the the universe and the world and and the structures of the world yes right? and to and to sort of formulate the structures just like um aristotle did with the four elements um Euclid does with geometry, with the point, almost the line, the, the Euclidean, um, what are they called, theorems? That's right. All, almost all of the geometry that we learn uh, in, in middle Euclid. school is Euclidean, absolutely. Yep. And here he's actually in the act of teaching. Yes. It's fabulous. Yes. And, you know, one of the things that is so important about this painting and, and makes it so high Renaissance is, is the way that the figures really interact with each other. Everyone's talking and gesturing, and there's no sense of stiffness at all. All the groups are so Dynamic. fluid, and, and there's, you know, it just, every, everyone just looks like they're just hanging out and talking and having fun. And, and this and, is a forum. It's, 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 a, how complicated uh, it is to create these groups of 10 people. It's a dance, really, that he's created. It's an amazing it? achievement. Of course, Raphael himself is painted here. He is. Um, among the astronomers in the, in the lower right corner. Mm -hmm. He's the Peeking one out. who's looking directly at us. Yes. <laughs>